Well, uh, good evening, dear friends. Good morning, Sakur. Um, uh, good evening, uh, Gega. It's a great pleasure and a great honor at this very, very important historic times, uh, really, uh, to have you as uh, the distinguished uh, and mostly highly qualified for the position to talk about the NATO summit, which is going to start tomorrow uh, in Madrid. Uh, we will not talk only about NATO, and uh, we have uh, at the Rondelli Foundation's webinar today. You all know uh, this uh, gentleman, but uh, still, I have the honor to uh, introduce and welcome uh, Ambassador Kurt Volker, uh, the former ambassador of United States to NATO. Uh, he voluntarily served as the special representative uh, of the President uh, of the United States for Ukraine. Uh, currently, uh, he is the um, founding um, member of the uh, Kiev American University and uh, the distinguished uh, fellow at the uh, CIPA, which is the Center for European Policy Analysis. Grigol uh, Galablishvili uh, Gega, welcome, uh, welcome to our webinar again. And he is also the former ambassador, special uh, uh, permanent representative of Georgia to NATO. Uh, shortly, he has served as the prime minister of Georgia. And now he is the associated professor at the NATO uh, <laughs> National Defense College at the uh, United Arab Emirates. Dear friends, welcome. It's a great pleasure and a great honor. Um, uh, of course, I want to hear from you and the, the audience uh, today wants to hear from you. What are your expectations for tomorrow? A lot of things are coming out. I mean, uh, the, there were the announcements, the, the previews made by the Secretary General. Some, uh, we have seen uh, the strategic concept should be adopted tomorrow. And uh, the Russians are already nervous about uh, designating them as the, uh, the, the biggest uh, threat, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, for NATO uh, in this new concept. Uh, of course, in the very, very center of the discussions will be how to help Ukraine uh, in the fight against the, uh, Russia's uh, invasion unjustified uh, and unprovoked how to help to defeat uh, uh, Russia in Ukraine uh, and uh, what else is going to be decided. And what are the, of course, Georgia is always on our mind and what uh, should be expected for Georgia, what should have been done, what has not been done and uh, what are the perspectives for Georgia and Ukraine from the point of the future integration in NATO. Of course, I hope you will talk about maybe good news about Sweden and Finland uh, uh, joining uh, NATO. So I will stop here, dear Kurt. Uh, you start the, the, uh, the protocol is, you start with your opening remarks, then I will give the floor to, uh, to Gega. And after your uh, opening remarks, I have a bunch of questions, I mean, uh, besides which I have already raised. So there will be the questions, uh, dear uh, participants, dear guests, you can put the question in the chat uh, and uh, we will put it directly uh, to Kurt and uh, Gega. Thank you. And the floor is yours, Kurt. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Alex Gega. Great to be with you as well. And uh, I won't try to answer all of those questions in one shot because I'd be talking for an hour. <laughs> so let me just say a few things and we'll come back to them in the Q&A. Uh, but the most important thing is that NATO has a summit meeting you know, every year or two or three. Uh, it's a common occurrence. This is the first time that NATO is having a summit meeting when the backdrop is the biggest war in Europe since World War II. So this is, this is news, uh, and this is a tremendously important context for what NATO is doing. The second thing is that before February, uh, be before Russia invaded Ukraine again for the third time in its independent life here, um, no one was thinking about NATO being a robust alliance needing to defend Europe. 
uh, NATO was going to write a strategic concept and talk about cyber threats in China. And uh, Macron was saying that NATO was brain dead because it was doing the same thing that it's always done, which is defense planning for Europe when there were no threats to Europe. That is all completely changed. And everyone now sees that A, Putin is a major threat to Europe. He has declared his intention to rebuild the Russian empire, taking lands that Peter the Great once took, which could even include the Baltic states or Poland, which are members of NATO. Um, and this therefore means that NATO has to re, uh, reinvest in its principal mission of collective defense of its members. And NATO has done a good job at this throughout the crisis, throughout this war. But now what we're hearing out of Madrid is that there are some longer range plans to rebuild uh, or to build up the uh, high readiness forces to a level of 300,000 and to more permanently station forces in the Eastern members of the Alliance. So in that respect, I think that's one way in which NATO is showing that it is going to meet the challenge of collective defense for the future against this Russian threat. Now, what NATO has not done is anything to help Ukraine. Uh, individual allies, the United States, the UK, Poland, Lithuania, et cetera, they have done a lot to help Ukraine. Uh, but NATO as an alliance has not. And so there are a couple of things from this. One of them is drawing this bright line around protecting NATO members has the inadvertent effect of saying, if you're not a NATO member, uh, you, can, you can be attacked and we're, we won't do anything. Uh, it also has the effect of saying that maybe leaving countries out of NATO is a bad idea. <laughs> maybe you're inviting violence by doing that. Uh, and we've seen that Russia has attacked Georgia, it's attacked Ukraine, uh, it, it still occupies part of Moldova. So maybe leaving these gray zones on the table was a bad idea. And the final point that I'll make in this part here is just to turn it specifically to Georgia. Um, Georgia has always been seen as one of the leading reformers among the former Soviet states. Uh, uh, economically, ease of doing business, democratic institutions, etc. Uh, there have been some perceptions that Georgia has fallen backwards a bit in the past few years, but fundamentally it still remains a democracy, a market economy, a country that is committed to being part of Europe. But Europe and NATO were never ready for Georgia. Uh, there was never a consensus within NATO to admit Georgia as a member or within the EU to bring Georgia into the EU. And you, we all remember the Bucharest summit where we got this vague commitment. So yes, you can be a member someday, but no membership action plan. And NATO actually for 14 years kept saying, membership action plan is the next step and no, you can't have it. <laughs> and so this is not encouraging for Georgia <clears throat> until this year. What's happened is because of Russia's war on Ukraine, the, Europe is now looking at Ukraine as truly a European country, a member of the European family, as Macron said. And this has, for the first time, opened the door in a real way for EU membership for Ukraine, but also for Georgia and also for Moldova. The language that the EU used was different. They're trying to send a signal on reforms, but the door is now open for the first time. I think the same thing will happen with NATO after the war. I think that no one will think that it makes sense for Ukraine to be a neutral country when countries like Finland and Sweden say it's not safe to be a neutral country. So I think we'll get back to NATO uh, opening the door as well. And that would also apply to Georgia and Moldova. So this is truly an opportunity for Georgia that didn't exist even four months ago. Uh, this is all because of Russia's war on Ukraine and Ukraine's defense of these values uh, in Ukraine. And now this is an opportunity for Georgia, which everyone in Georgia, every political party, every politician, every member of parliament, every person, government or opposition, everyone should be focused on going through that checklist 
that the EU has provided and making sure that Georgia does everything possible to live up to the expectations and standards for EU membership and eventually also for NATO membership. Now is the time. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. I uh, also hope that uh, the, the, the landscape, geopolitical landscape is dramatically really has changed uh, since the war started. Uh, it's hard to say when the people are dying in, in Ukraine, but this is the real opportunity for, uh, for Georgia, uh, for Moldova, for Ukraine itself. And uh, um, I, I hope very much that you, your words will be heard uh, that here in Georgia throughout the whole country and the all politicians on all sides. Uh, <laughs> I still want to hope that they will hear this message and they will uh, unite their uh, efforts uh, to move forward and to do whatever is needed on this uh, checklist for the uh, European Union. I'll come back to this uh, checklist and, and the challenges and the obstacles for um, uh, the doing this, uh, ticking the boxes on these 12 recommendations, but first, let me uh, go to uh, Gega and uh, turn the floor to Gega. What do you think, Gega? How, how uh, is it seen uh, from your perspective, the, the developments which are taking place in, in Europe and Euro-Atlantic space? And what are the challenges and the perspectives for the, uh, for the countries uh, uh, Kurt was talking about? Hi, thank you, Alex. Thank you for uh, your invitation. I, I... And Kurt, it's great to see you again. Uh, I, I want just simply to use this opportunity and to thank Ambassador Walker for his unwavering support to Georgia, Georgian people, Ukraine, Ukrainian people, and his tireless efforts to, uh, to help uh, all those frontline states uh, to achieve their uh, eventual uh, goal of joining the family of free nations and in their fight for freedom as well. Ambassador, we very much appreciate your efforts. Thank you so much. Now, uh, I'll, Alex, I'll try to follow very briefly your outline. I know that it's a tall order, but I'll, I'll do my, I, my best. So uh, I agree with Ambassador Walker. It's a, it's a historic moment. Uh, and uh, what is really happening uh, at the backdrop of the summit is that NATO is basically going to its core mission, the collective defense, the mission that has been somehow blurred throughout the years. So now collective defense, again, is becoming number one uh, uh, issue that, uh, on, on which the NATO was basically founded on. Uh, now, uh, four main uh, probably uh, takeaways from our uh, potential outcomes of this summit that uh, Secretary General uh, frequently labels as transformative uh, summit. So one strategic context, obviously it's important. It's a blueprint that would guide the alliance in coming years, at least for a decade. To be frank, my take is I'm very glad that it's gonna replace the old strategic uh, context that from my perspective is a clear manifestation of the strategic blunders that some of our allies and uh, strategic uh, partners uh, did with uh, Russia uh, years ago, the series of strategic blunders, because if you, I'm glad that eventually Russia is uh, uh, named as a main threat to uh, Euro-Atlantic values and security. However, in 2010, after the invasion of Georgia, after the flagrant violation of international law, NATO was still considering Russia as a strategic partner. So I, I hope that this uh, this is over now, and I, I really very much hope that uh, those people who were somehow responsible uh, for those uh, strategic uh, mistakes uh, won't push the, at least will rethink their stance and won't push an agenda of uh, uh, finding some uh, face-saving options for President Putin instead of defeating Russia in this very important uh, war against Ukraine. Uh, now, the second uh, important uh, takeaway uh, outcome uh, probably will be the significant uh, restructure of the uh, defense posture. Uh, what I mean, and Ambassador uh, Walker alluded to that as well, this is the uh, uh, strengthening the uh, uh, military presence in eastern flank uh, and also dramatic increase of the NRF, uh, NATO response uh, force, 
with uh, uh, increasing up to 300,000, the high readiness forces, that is very impressive. Uh, I would argue, however, that uh, it seems that the NATO will still uh, pursue this tripwire approach uh, to the eastern flank uh, instead of permanent substantial uh, uh, deployment of uh, troops in Baltic states, for instance, that, for instance, Estonians are advocating. Uh, so I wish there was this change in this approach. However, again, this is still, a, uh, from my perspective, a positive uh, outcome. The third very important uh, potential outcome uh, might be that this summit could have uh, become a very important historical enlargement summit as well. Uh, I mean, there are still the chances as we talk, I know that there is a very high level series of very high level meetings taking place uh, in, uh, in Madrid. Uh, but from, uh, from an aspirant country's perspective, uh, there are two important uh, uh, two important aspects of freedom of uh, Finland and Sweden joining the alliance. First, this would obviously strengthen the NATO because both uh, Finland and Sweden are uh, not only strong on their values but uh, from military uh, aspect as well. But uh, the second, it will also uh, will be a clear manifestation of the open continuation of the open door policy and a very clear response to President Putin. So unfortunately, there is still this objections from Ankara. Uh, we'll see whether those objections can be overcome or not uh, overnight. Uh, if not, I'm confident that, uh, I don't think, I, I'm confident that in coming weeks or months, allies uh, eventually will manage to uh, overcome the Ankara's objection and Finland and Sweden will join the alliance. So that's, that's an important uh, outcome. The uh, last one is, uh, and uh, I wholly agree with uh, Ambassador Walker, let's see what kind of substantial uh, package, substantial support Secretary General is talking about when it comes to the war in Ukraine or to Ukrainian government and Ukrainian people. Uh, this is an important aspect to uh, uh, not only to provide assistance, but also to clearly articulate the strategic objective of all allies when it comes to their historic uh, struggle against uh, Putin's Russia, that Russia should be defeated in this conflict. So those are, when we look to probably the main, I mean, there are some other issues obviously, but those from, from my perspective are the main issues that the, uh, uh, that the uh, summit will focus on. Very quickly, from the Georgian perspective, we have a bad news and good news. The good news is that uh, Georgia will still be somehow visible. The optics might be uh, not bad, so it will show that the Georgia is somehow still uh, on the radar screen of the uh, alliance. There will be some kind of a, a, a package uh, to uh, Georgia, some kind of an assistance uh, to uh, help its defense and security sectors. However, the areas that I uh, that I uh, saw so far is insignificant. Uh, and uh, I hope that it will be more substantial than the first indications uh, are so far. Uh, bad news is, again, the Georgia's integration process is stalled. And uh, we uh, shouldn't expect any meaningful, uh, any meaningful progress uh, from this uh, summit. And this leads me to my final two points uh, that I want to end uh, my introductory remarks. First, uh, we shouldn't be naive. And in order to achieve any substantial progress, either towards NATO or towards EU integration, we need to get our house in order. Uh, uh, oh, the form of governance that uh, currently has formed in Georgia is completely incompatible with the values of both NATO and the EU. And we also should keep in mind that NATO is not only military alliance, but it's an alliance of, uh, of values, or alliance of states uh, that shares a common values as well. So the state capture, oligarchic rules, the broken justice system, uh, increase of the number of political prisoners, it's not the values that usually European democracies or Euro-Atlantic democracies expect from the candidate uh, nation. So, uh, we need first and foremost to get our house in order. Uh, we have some, uh, uh, some, uh, I cautiously optimistic, some, uh, uh, some positive signs, at least the 
hundreds of thousands of the Georgian people have spoken. They, they, uh, they showed their unwavering support to Georgia's European Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, future. We had hundreds of thousands of people uh, just a uh, few days ago rallying in the streets of Tbilisi, probably unprecedented number, at least in my memory, since the end of uh, 80s. Uh, so let's see where this process uh, leads us to. The second is, uh, and again, uh, Ambassador Walker uh, alluded to this issue as well, NATO itself should uh, clearly define uh, a more strategic vision what to do with gray zone areas, the frontline states, because if this war, uh, this aggression against Ukraine uh, taught us something is that uh, you cannot if you are within or even the member of this club, you cannot be fully secure or fully stable if your neighborhood or if the, uh, let's say this gray zone areas or insecure areas that aspire but have no commitment yet to become a, a member uh, are not part of the Euro-Atlantic uh, institutions. Gray zones are dangerous and uh, NATO has to come up with a strategic vision uh, towards uh, that. Otherwise, I would argue that stabilizing or uh, defending uh, Euro-Atlantic security uh, may become a mission impossible. So I'll, I'll stay here and pass the floor back to you, Alex. Thank you, Giga. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, very, very straightforward comments and uh, the remarks. Um, about the gray zones and about it uh, bringing house in the order in uh, here in georgia uh what should be done what uh, is needed to be done and uh, uh how realistic is and how possible uh, to uh, this all uh, to be done but uh, first, let me uh, uh, get to the Ukraine's issue. You uh, both talk about the war in Ukraine, about Russia's invasion in Ukraine. We are hearing that um, NATO will announce another uh, assistance uh, package, if uh, we can say so, about uh, the, the, by supporting uh, Ukraine how it may look like. Yesterday, we saw that uh, the, the G7 countries uh, again demonstrated the unwavering, declared the unwavering uh, uh, support to Ukraine uh, with no limits uh, in military, in financing, in political support. Today was a very dramatic and very uh, tragic day for Ukraine. We saw that uh, Russia is increasing the uh, in intensified bombing of the civilian infrastructure. And in Kremenchuk, uh, uh, Russians have bombed the, the, the trade center. Is there any chance, Ambassador? First, uh, but Ukrainian President Zelensky has asked for designating Russia as the state of this, as a sponsor of terrorism. That's one. In the second, uh, he is again talking about the, the providing the um, um, uh, urgent military assistance from for air defense systems and anything uh, else what is needed to protect the civilians because uh, uh, Russians are bombing the civilian facilities. I mean, the housing, you know, houses, uh, the trade centers, um, uh, movie theaters, et cetera, et cetera. So they are burning down the whole the territories. Uh, I always hear this question when I have the, the delivering the lectures to the students or to the different auditoriums that uh, why uh, the military equipment is late, why they are not getting enough uh, equipment on time. What is the problem? And uh, is there any news about the land lease? Uh, is it, is it, has it started already, Ambassador? Sorry, yeah, a lot of questions there. Uh, I'll try to touch on them. Um, first, I'm not aware of NATO making a decision to do anything for Ukraine. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I am aware that the United States is going to be 
uh, announcing further drawdowns of support, drawdowns of assist uh, funding to provide more equipment to Ukraine. And some of this equipment will be uh, a advanced air defense system, an anti-missile system, uh, which is very, very important. Um, as we've seen, um, the no-fly zone concept never went anywhere. Uh, the war has changed since people talked about that. We're not seeing as many Russian uh, aircraft flying over Ukraine, but we are seeing missile attacks occasionally. And what Russia is doing is using a, a ground invasion in eastern Ukraine to try to take territory, uh, Donbas, the land bridge to Crimea and so forth. But then they're also using missiles to randomly attack Ukrainian cities just to keep the pressure on the Ukrainians and on the West. Uh, this is uh, horrific, as we saw yesterday with the bombing of this shopping center. Uh, it puts civilians directly in harm's way in an illegal uh, war crimes fashion. And uh, that is something that we, we do need to try to help the Ukrainians to prevent by giving them these anti-missile systems. Now, why is this aid so late and insufficient? Uh, it's a great question because many people, and I was one of them, but many people argued that we should have provided more support to Ukraine before the war started. We should have sanctioned Russia for its military buildup, not waiting for them to invade. And then once the invasion started, we should have no restrictions on the types of support that we will provide to Ukraine. And it has taken us weeks and weeks and months to get to the point where we are doing what we could have been doing three or four months ago. Uh, the US administration and many NATO allies uh, have in mind some kind of threshold where if we do X or Y, then Russia will widen the war and might go nuclear, it might attack NATO countries, it might consider that we are at war with Russia and widen the conflict, escalate the conflict. And nobody wants to be in a direct war with Russia and nobody wants the risk of a nuclear war. So the administration keeps setting these lines. Uh, the current ones are the distance of which we can fire artillery shells. We'll say it's okay for you know, this medium range, but not for the longest range. Uh, not providing fighter aircraft. I don't know why, but there's a perception that fighter aircraft would be bad. Uh, telling the Ukrainians, don't attack anything on Russian territory. I'm not sure why uh, <laughs> Russia is attacking Ukraine on Ukrainian territory and the Ukrainians are defending themselves. Uh, but So why not if they're being fired on from Russia? or if the supplies and the support for this effort is coming from Russia, why not? But the administration and many allies are putting in place these kinds of mental restrictions. And that also then leads to an attitude of supporting Ukraine, but limiting our support for Ukraine. And that also means being slow with the, the decisions and the deliveries uh, as well. Something that is really unfortunate and has cost uh, many, many Ukrainian lives. Uh, and uh, I also asked you about the, the uh, designating Russia as the uh, state of sponsoring terrorism. I'm sorry putting for yeah. too many yeah, questions yeah. at one time, but uh, it's really, it is discussed in, uh, in uh, Congress and uh, it has been okayed by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How high are the chances uh, to, to get there and to get it on the table for the president? Yeah, so it's a great question. And you're right, the, the Congress is willing to pass legislation to push this. It won't be binding on the administration. It'll be a recommendation from the Congress, a sense of the Senate, sense of the Congress, that this is what should be done. I think objectively, you can make a very strong case that Russia is acting as a terrorist state uh, because it is deliberately uh, conducting attacks, random attacks on civilian populations in order to create terror, uh, just as, as we saw with that shopping mall. So I think it will come forward as a recommendation. 
I have to say, I would be surprised if at this stage, the US administration, the Biden administration agreed to do it. I think they're going to hold this back and try to preserve some kind of ability to resume a relationship with Russia uh, if they end the war. Uh, so there is, I think, a hesitancy there still. But as with so many other things in this war, first the administration says no to something, and then they go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> so we weren't going to provide Stinger missiles. Um, we weren't going to provide heavy weapons. Uh, we weren't going to provide long range artillery and so on and so on. And then we end up doing them anyway. We weren't going to do the swift sanctions against Russia's participation in financial institutions and on and on. So it is possible that this could happen and they could be designated a state sponsor of terrorism if they keep up doing what they're doing. But at this stage, I don't think it's likely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Um, Gegam, we have been discussing in uh, uh, touching upon the uh, statements or the let's say the, uh, the the will of some of the European leaders uh, to to face saving uh, to save the face of uh, Putin or uh, not to irritate uh, uh, too much uh, Russia uh, because it has to come back to the negotiations table. So. After all these uh, developments, after all these tragic developments, which uh, took place right in the uh, middle of the uh, meeting of the G7 leaders and meeting with the Ukrainian pre president, do you expect and uh, watching at these statements which were made by the, uh, the G7 leaders, do you expect that uh, there still could be a chance because I'm always nervous and worried when I hear from Prime Minister of United Kingdom, Kingdom great uh, individual politician, uh, Boris Johnson, that there is the danger that someone could offer Ukraine to uh, agree on a peace, uh, uh, compromising some uh, territories uh, of uh, Ukraine. Uh, is there a still a danger uh, to, to have this kind of uh, uh, pressure put on uh, Ukrainian president? And uh, is finally Europe and the United States are united that it is impossible to continue uh, to, to dance uh, with Vladimir Putin and uh, to, to consider him as a possible negotiator and the partner? Uh, the short answer to this is Really very important question is, yes, this is this danger. And, but uh, let me explain where I see the main, main risks uh, from my perspective. Now, uh, this was a very important week. So EU summit, uh, G7 summit, NATO summit is uh, coming uh, or starting tomorrow. Uh, and so far, uh, let's say the Western leaders uh, managed to uh, uh, show this unified front. So uh, they, uh, they maintain the unity. So. Uh, also, and uh, they, they were unified when it comes to imposing further sanctions on Russia, uh, supporting Ukraine, uh, defining the strategic objectives that the, uh, Russia should be defeated. So, so far they managed that. But the real danger and real uh, differences are what happens if, let's say, we all know that Russia is exhausting also uh, its potential uh, to continue the uh, uh, full-fledged uh, invasion. Uh, and if a, a, to a certain extent, uh, Russians uh, decide that that's a kind of a fait accompli we achieved, we control a certain uh, Ukrainian territory that we can sell as our success back to home, to our people, to our constituency as well. And if they decide to freeze the conflict, and to uh, push the Ukrainians to, uh, to start negotiating on new uh, normal or new status quo, then this is, a, this is a potential where I think that we may see some, uh, some differences uh, within the Western allies. And that's a scenario that I hope that we will be able uh, to avoid uh, because uh, all, I hope that at least the one lesson that uh, all, the, uh, all the European leaders should learn from this uh, outrageous aggression uh, against the Ukrainian people is that Russia would never stop. 
Russia will uh, simply uh, uh, regain the time, uh, will become uh, probably stronger, and uh, will uh, will continue uh, with its uh, expansionist policies as it uh, always has done. Because I mean, again, I don't want to go back to the history, but 2008, Alex, you were there, I was there. We were arguing that next would be Ukraine. We were uh, told at that time that we were uh, crying the wolf. The so Ukraine came and the uh, response was a uh, very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, very cautious uh, response from the, uh, from the Western allies. Uh, then there was again the farther aggression. Then again, 2022, and I agree with Ambassador Walker, there should be, uh, the, again, uh, Europe, European Union, our Western allies should have uh, imposed sanctions before the outbreak of the conflict or start uh, arming Ukraine uh, before the actual conflict started because there was intelligence that this conflict was coming. So we all knew that this conflict was coming and we learned this from uh, very reliable intelligence sources. So just to wrap up my answer, yes, there is this danger. I don't see that this danger in let's say in coming days or weeks, but as soon as Russia decides to freeze this conflict, this may uh, create certain divisions within the Western alliance. Um, uh, Kurt, you have talked about the nuclear threat and uh, possibly nobody wants, really nobody wants to, to go nuclear and uh, nuclear war with, uh, with Russia. Uh, first question is, again, the group of questions. The first question is, how big is this real threat of, uh, of uh, uh, how real is the threat of uh, nuclear war? Uh, with Russia or nuclear attack from Russia on uh, Ukraine. And the second question is that um, there is also a lot of talks, uh, especially from uh, uh, Russian propagandists, uh, from Russian officials. It's, I understand this is for internal use, but uh, then the, the, the means, but uh, um, they talk a lot about the possibility of the Third World War, and they say that if uh, Lithuania uh, the, does not give up with blocking the, the, the transit corridor for Kaliningrad, uh, there should be the um, uh, <clears throat> reactions and not only diplomatic reactions from the uh, Russian side. How big is the threat uh, how uh, i adore really lithuanian people and their braveness i mean uh, to standing up against uh the russian federation and i believe they will get the uh, adequate support from their nato allies but uh is it really all uh, leading us to the uh, increasing possibility of the third world war well, I don't think so, uh, but it's worth talking about and it's worth uh, being careful. Um, Russia does have a large nuclear arsenal. And of course, nuclear weapons, if used, would be utterly devastating. Uh, so we, we need to avoid this. But as we break it down, uh, first off, strategic nuclear exchange, you know, Russia attacking the United States or attacking NATO allies with, with uh, missile, intercontinental missiles or even intermediate range missiles. I think that's very unlikely because Russia knows that there would be an immediate military response and possibly nuclear response against Russia and it would annihilate Russia. So I think any strategic nuclear exchange is very unlikely. Whether Russia would use a tactical nuclear weapon in its war against Ukraine uh, that is more possible, but I also think it's unlikely, uh, partly because you know, the doctrine that Russia has of escalating in order to de-escalate really only makes sense if you're defending yourself. If, if you have an aggressor coming in and, and you're, you're not succeeding in conventional means to stop them, then taking them out with a nuclear weapon would make sense. But if it's a war of conquest, which is what Russia is on right now in Ukraine, trying to take pieces of Ukraine. You actually destroy the territory and make it uninhabitable, uh, which defeats your own objective in trying to take the territory. So I think that that is uh, le not very likely that they would do it, although it is possible, it is possible. They're capable of anything. Um, 
What was your second question, Alex? About uh, Lithuania and about the third. third okay, and World, World War III. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is something that the Russians do to get inside the heads of Western leaders. They keep threatening. Uh, if you do this, it's going to be World War III. We can expand the conflict because they know that Western leaders want to avoid that. And so they hope that we will back down from doing things that Russia doesn't want us to do. And so they keep threatening that way. Russian forces, conventional military forces, are having a very difficult time in Ukraine. Uh, they were not able to take the capital. They were not able to take the whole country. They are making very slow progress in Eastern Ukraine and suffering huge casualties, both pers personnel as well as destruction of equipment. They've probably lost between a third and a half of their conventional military capability that they had when they started the war. Uh, this is a, a huge loss for any country. And Russia is not really in a position to open another front in the war anywhere. And if they did, particularly if it was against a NATO country, they would know that there would be a direct NATO military response and that they would not survive it very well. Uh, so I think it's very unlikely that Russia would actually widen the war in any way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me also add one uh, before before the question. Just one. Uh, 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 Putin, President Putin, is a rational actor. He is not suicidal. So uh, and uh, I think that also. I mean, I, I agree with Ambassador Walker. Uh, uh, I don't see any major uh, nuclear. Uh, using nuclear weapons as a likely scenario. I, another aspect from my perspective why uh, Russians uh, used uh, nuclear blackmail is also to scare the Western publics as well, because what was very unexpected from a uh, Russian perspective was to see this uh, enormous mounting Western support uh, to Ukraine. Uh, let's say the hundreds, almost uh, half a million people gathered in the center of Berlin to uh, weeks ago to support uh, Ukrainians in other European cities. So uh, this, this is something that they wanted somehow to scale down uh, and to, uh, to show to the Western uh, public that uh, if they continue, if this escalates, it may, it may reach third capitals as well, or it may have some uh, nuclear uh, development. So I think that again, scaring the Western publics was uh, one of, one of the, uh, one of the uh, rationale uh, why Russians uh, used the uh, nuclear card uh, in their discourse. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Giga. Uh, it's about the Western societies. Uh, and Western publics. I want to ask you both, uh, both of you about uh, the question, which is related somehow to the previous one. Uh, the autumn will come, <laughs> definitely. And uh, the, the uh, uh, inflation is very high. Uh, the prices for the utilities, uh, the, the heating uh, and the electricity are very high. The, the, the uh, sports, Refrigerators to be filled uh, are very expensive, getting more and more expensive. Should could it affect the Western society's uh, uh, approach towards uh, the war in Ukraine? Could it? Uh, could we see the the the, the uh, fatigue with the Ukrainian war in upcoming months, which could affect then the? Uh, um, decisions of their leaders uh, in the European and Euro-Atlantic countries. Well, I think yes <laughs> is, the, is, is the answer, and it's a problem. Um, because Western leaders really want to avoid being in any conflict, um, their inclination is to just want the war to end at any cost. And so there is a temptation with Russia's willingness to escalate and, and issue threats um, that they will tell the Ukrainians, look, you, have to, you, you can't keep fighting forever. You have to give up some territory. You have to have peace again. And we see this periodically. I mean, we heard it from Macron about a week or two ago. We, we heard it from Schultz. Then they get embarrassed and they stop saying it for a little bit. And then they come back and start saying it again. 
And traveling in Europe recently uh, and having some private meetings, you hear it all the time. Uh, so that is, a, that is a worry. And I also worry that the United States would be susceptible to that too, if that's where the European allies are. So the Ukrainians are doing everything they can to keep the issue on, on, on the, the front burner, to keep the war in Ukraine foremost in everyone's mind and the injustice of Russia's attacks and, and, and murder of, of people and how unacceptable it would be to reward that aggression. And I, I, I hope that at the end of the day, we can hold firm and push back on Russia and support the Ukrainians in fighting back against Russia. But it really is a worry, uh, particularly among Western European governments, that they, they, they would push the Ukrainians to, to give up territory in exchange for, for a pause in the war. Uh, I, I completely agree. That's, I mean, again, I, I partly answered some of this is one of the major uh, risks that probably uh, some of the, uh, probably some, especially some of the European allies may push, uh, may push uh, Ukrainians uh, to uh, come to an unjust uh, concession. Uh, uh, any conflict has its own evolutionary logic. And there are, I see two dangers. One is any conflict, how much unjust it is, uh, eventually causes some war fatigue uh, in international uh, society. So one danger is, and we may see already some signs of that. So we may see it even stronger, uh, let's say in uh, coming uh, uh, in coming months. Uh, uh, that's that's the first one. The second one, as you alluded, Alex, is again uh, certain economic costs because sanctions uh, are very costly for Russia, but it has a cost for the Western societies as well, and it will be felt uh, in uh, probably uh, in every uh, family or in most of the families, especially if the gas prices are going up. That everyone feels those uh, economic costs of the conflict. So, and this will uh, obviously, especially in democracies uh, where the uh, public opinion is the driving force of uh, political processes, will create uh, obviously a uh, tremendous pressure. So what, what to do to avoid this? Uh, what to do? We know that this may happen. We know it already a uh, few months before that. So what should be done? I think that uh, the tempo of providing Ukrainians the uh, military equipment should be uh, increased uh, and uh, Ukraine should uh, get uh, its uh, uh, necessary uh, military uh, capabilities as soon as possible. Uh, at least uh, to come to a point where Ukrainian people will accept that, okay, this is a, a point where we can uh, end the conflict. This conflict should end on Ukrainian terms, not on the Russian terms, because if it ends on the Russian terms, then we will see another and more devastating uh, conflict uh, affecting Europe. I, I completely agree with that. And Alex, um... I know we only have 10 minutes and I see a question in the chat here about um, yes. Sweden. And I just wanted to address that briefly if I could. Sure, um, sure. I was I, just about to ask you about it. Okay, good. I think that um, this will get solved. I think Turkey and Sweden and Finland will agree and that they will be admitted to NATO. If it happens today, that's great. Uh, and they can have a formal invitation, but if it takes a little more time, that's okay too. Um, there's nothing that prevents an invitation being issued after the summit as well. And I don't think that it's going to be that difficult. And the reason I say this is Sweden and Finland and Turkey all agree on the principle of opposing terrorism, uh, that no one wants to be in a position of providing any kind of support for terrorists. So it really comes down to a discussion of the details who is a terrorist and what are the actions that they take or what actions should be prevented or prohibited under a country's laws. Uh, the, the Swedes differentiate between uh, all Kurds versus uh, Kurds who support terrorism in Turkey. And to some degree, the Turks do as well. They have very good relations with the Turkish government in Erbil uh, in Northern Iraq. Uh, so. This is something where they need to have a quiet and frank conversation with each other about the measures that can be taken to assure Turkey 
that Swedish territory or Finnish territory would not be used by any Kurdish groups to support terrorism while protecting the democratic rights of people of Kurdish origin in Sweden, uh, some many of whom are now Swedish citizens. Uh, since I, I, I was ambassador to Turkey as well, alongside the NATO, let me add my two cents to this uh, process. And I, again, I agree with uh, Kurt's analysis. And uh, uh, one, impor uh, one important uh, point as well, Ambassador Erdogan is facing the major elections uh, next uh, year. Uh, and uh, inviting uh, Finland and Sweden to alliance is a, probably one of the most important strategic decisions that NATO has taken uh, uh, recently. Uh, and uh, once you are also in a, uh, in a NATO, and of course the decisions are based on consensus, but if you are alone, it's very difficult to hold or to, uh, or to block the consensus for a long time, especially on a highly important strategic issue. If you do that, this is going to have a significant political price. And I don't think that uh, uh, President Erdogan uh, will like, uh, especially before this upcoming uh, elections, to pay this political uh, price by blocking the Finland and Sweden. I think that he made his point loud and clear. Uh, he uh, used this card for his domestic audience. And if this uh, enlargement doesn't work out during the summit, uh, any NAC meeting can invite uh, Finland and Sweden in coming weeks or months. So I think that it's going to be resolved relatively soon. Uh, thank you, dear friends. Last question comes from our good friend, Elena Gotsadze. Uh, she it's, uh, greets you from Georgia. Ambassador Walker, uh, this is a question for you. I'm sure you are well informed and following to the developments in Georgia. Political discussions, some speculations, some alarming messages. So I'm curious, how does it look like from the United States or in NATO? What is your guess or opinion? Is Georgia changing its foreign priorities, or this is just another scenario for the game or of the game? Right. I, um, think I want you to to answer this question too. Sure. Uh, so it's very important. If you read the EU uh, decision on candidate status for Ukraine and Moldova, and Georgia would also be offered candidate status if it implements certain reforms. And then it gives a, a, an explanation as to, to what the EU is looking for. The first thing that the EU says there is political polarization. And that is absolutely true. Uh, and the EU still remembers putting a lot of personal energy by Charles Michel into getting an agreement between the government and the opposition, including the UNM, to get the parliament back on track, people take their seats, uh, have uh, a pathway to more reforms in Georgia, including the judiciary. And having gone to all of that effort, the UNM uh, refused to sign it. And then a month or so or more went by. And so the government unsigned it. And then the UNM said, okay, we'll sign it uh, after the government pulled out. This is the kind of ridiculousness, <laughs> frankly, ridiculousness of political polarization um, that the EU is talking about. Uh, if, you, if you meet with people, as I do every time I go to Georgia, I meet with people from the opposition, from the government, UNM, everybody that I can, uh, members of the media, civil society, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone agrees on the vision. They want Georgia to be a democracy. They want Georgia to be part of Europe. Uh, and they want Georgia to be safe and they wanna get the territories back from Russia. Nobody disagrees on any of this. And yet it seems impossible for people in the government and opposition, GD, UNM, et cetera, to work together. Um, this is, I think, really endangering the country now, this, this, this polarization. Um, my, I posted in the chat um, an article that I published for CIFO last week. I'd encourage people to look at it. I make a specific recommendation there and I'll put it out right now. Uh, I would highly recommend that uh, the government opposition decide that they appoint a technocratic commission of experts, 
including international experts, not just Georgians, but international experts as well. Not a government, not a technocratic government like the opposition is calling for, just an expert panel. And that expert panel should in a very dispassionate and specific way, look at all of the things the EU is saying, and in some cases make some corrections because I think the EU misstates some things. In some cases say, okay, here is what Georgia should do to address this issue and create a series of recommendations and explanations and then present this to a parliamentary uh, body specifically convened for the purpose of reviewing these recommendations, all parties uh, to review this. Because I think for the benefit of the country, these sorts of things need to be depoliticized. They need to be taken out of the competition between the GD and the UNM and the other opposition parties. Um, these things are of a higher order national interest. And this is a rare moment for Georgia where the, the window really is open for obtaining candidate status in the EU, ultimately EU membership, and potentially even NATO membership, it, the country can't afford to miss it. Is there a chance for the oligarchization? I think, that, so I have this experience from Ukraine as well too. And it's both a good word and a loaded word because and then everybody argues about what it means. And, um, and not. Take, yeah, take the Ukrainian example. There are some oligarchs who are criminals. <laughs> who have killed people or who have um, you know, been indicted and they're in exile or, or Kolomoisky, for instance, who ripped off Privat Bank and stole $6 billion. And there are others who are very successful, wealthy business people who have successful businesses like Viktor Pinchuk, who, um, who has a pipeline business or Akhmedov, who has uh, energy business. So you can't throw them all in the same category. What you should do in order to prevent the influence of uh, the undue influence of, of wealthy individuals or businesses in politics or in the economy is antitrust legislation. So you set laws as the United States did back in the early 1900s. You set laws about how one individ individual or business um, cannot own too much of any sector of an economy. There have, you have to create competition. And as long as you ensure and enforce competition, then the economy should be able to thrive. It's when there is monopolization or too much concentration of power, that's what holds things back. And then in politics, uh, it is a, a campaign finance issue. Many, many countries, including the United States, struggle with the idea of political financing and campaign financing and putting in place rules of the road for how that works would be the other major reform. It's not about individuals and targeting individuals, not about arresting people. Uh, it is about setting rules of the road, both for the economy and for money and politics that the society can live with in order to ensure fair competition. Uh, thank you, Kurt. Last comments, uh, Gegab. Uh, uh, very very, very quickly. So very quickly. The, uh, only goal that the current administration is uh, uh, is charted for itself is how to stay in power. Uh, and uh, any reform and uh, moving closer uh, to Europe uh, basically endangers uh, their uh, willingness to stay in power indefinitely. So, and they, they were very clear to uh, sacrifice uh, their willingness to stay in power uh, for the uh, compromises uh, or for the decisions to approximate Georgia towards the uh, European Union. So that's why from my, I'm, I'm unfortunately, I'm a little bit more skeptical. I don't think that because the form of the governance that exists in Georgia excludes any kind of the uh, European or Euro-Atlantic future because the broken justice system political prisoners, uh, the all signs of the state capture. So those are not the European values. And uh, again, uh, what makes our own oligarch, uh, which financially is probably not as big as some other oligarchs in different parts of the world, what makes him a very unique is that other oligarchs owns businesses, houses, uh, pipelines. Uh, our oligarch owns the whole country.
and that's his main asset. And I don't think that he is willing to give up this asset in exchange of any uh, promise uh, of, uh, for the European future. So my, I mean, again, I'm slightly skeptical uh, in this regard and only way out is that the people should speak and uh, we the uh, people should push as much as we can just to, uh, to ensure uh, that we, uh, with, in a very peaceful uh, way, push the government to uh, keep up. There is only one, and I know that we are over time, there is only one formula that will work. Uh, domestic pressure uh, from the people, uh, peaceful protest, and external pressure from our allies. That's the only thing that would work. Otherwise, there is a clear danger that we will be doomed to stay in a gray zone or even worse, to slide towards our northern neighbor. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I still had some questions. I would always love, I always love to chat with you to discuss the, the issues related to Georgia, to NATO, uh, NATO enlargement, Georgia's integration. We all agree, uh, definitely. And the 85% of Georgians agree that uh, Georgia should be uh, in the European Union and uh, slightly less, but up to 80% agree that uh, Georgia's the only security uh, is uh, provided by the NATO membership. Um, I, I didn't have the time to, to, to put the question about uh, what should happen first. Uh, first, should we, should we wait for the, uh, um, until Georgia is reunited uh, and then apply for uh, continue to work with NATO integration or should we first work on uh, NATO integration, and uh, it could lead us uh, to the uh, to the uh, Georgia's reunification. We have one minute, and you can you can uh, answer on this question, and I will really stop here. Uh, I, I'm I, I really got to join another meeting too. But simple answer: Please. do them both. <laughs> do, don't wait for anything. <laughs> Just act now. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Kega. Uh, the same, completely agree with uh, Ambassador Walker. So we need to do both. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate your time, your expertise, your experience and your answers, open and frank answers on the questions and the issues which uh, we have discussed today. Hope to see you uh, in Georgia, Kurt, uh, and uh, Gega, of course, and uh, Hope to continue these discussions on Georgia, not to stay in uh, the gray zone and, or even worse. Uh, even worse. Uh, <clears throat> I am skeptical too, a little bit, but uh, we'll see how the things will develop. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Thank you, uh, I look forward to hearing from you again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much.